Hi, welcome back everybody to the last session um, and hopefully the one where we have the most surprises for you um, and it's it going to be interesting. Uh, this is our one of our uh, chances to present to uh, an interested group of folks um, what our thoughts are in terms of um, where how we're modernizing the survey of income and program participation. Um, so uh, everybody sit down, this will be good. We can have a, a lot of open discussion afterwards. Um, and we're definitely looking for your feedback. Um, we wanna make this uh, an open open process and have, um, have a lot of input. So I'm gonna get started and then I'm gonna turn it over to Neil Bennett, who is our transition lead and, and doing a tremendous amount of work uh, to bring SIP Seamless into uh, existence. Um, and we're, we're both very excited to be able to, to share this with you. Next. All right, so the, um, this, is a, this is an image of the current central module of the, the SIP instrument as it is now. It's an annual survey that uses an 18 month recall tool called an event history calendar um, to collect person month data. So SIP has always collected monthly data. Um, this was uh, an, a, an attempt to bring that into an annual structure and it did a lot of good things for us, um, but it also had some unintended consequences. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about those. Um, so the information in this is designed to be able to have the respondents and the interviewers have a good conversation and to bring uh, coherence to their reporting of different topics, um, to be able to show uh, the, the, the relationship between changes in residents and changes in jobs and changes in health insurance and, um, and really improve the way those data work together. Um, we release a public use file from this annually, and we've gotten on a schedule now where we are releasing data um, by uh, approximately a year, a little less than a year after we've collected it, which is fantastic. SIP is in a really good place in terms of the data release. Um, we're also releasing a file structure that we think is more uh, user-friendly in a lot of ways for folks. Um, people are getting the calendar year as a uh, coherent 12 month uh, block of, of information for the entire household. So you have um, a rectangular file instead of uh, the traditional SIP parallelograms that, that original SIP users might have remembered uh, using. And, um, but there have been some issues. So next please. The first among them is the environment that we are doing this work in. Um, this is uh, information publicly available. It's on the BLS website. Um, and it basically shows you that the environment that the household surveys are operating in is one of declining response across surveys, even among the most centrally important surveys like CPS, which is measuring the unemployment rate, uh, the CE is a long and complicated survey. It is suffering similarly to SIP. Um, and you can see that we're, we're in a response er era where uh, we haven't been before. So we're thinking about data quality. We're thinking about response bias. Um, and it's not just SIP that's experiencing this. But next slide. SIP is experiencing it fairly significantly. Um, you can take a look at this. Basically, if you follow the lines from the top to the bottom, we're going from older panels to newer panels. Um, there are a couple dots. Uh, as you see the, the lines or the sets with, with dots with outlines, that represents the annual design. And I just placed them approximately annually on the, on the figure so you can see where they are in comparison to the older SIP design, which interviewed um, three times a year. SIP has been impacted over the course of the last uh, 10 years by um, repeated furloughs, uh, by continuing resolutions, which impacted our training and hiring. 
um, as well as just by the overall environment for, uh, for conducting household surveys and the declining response. SIP has also been the, a survey where, um, it, as a panel survey, it has sample attrition that uh, occur across the course of the duration of the panel, and you can see that here. Um, next slide, please. So in addition to overall unit non-response, there are there is non-response in uh, in at, at the item level at the section level, um, and SIP does have item non-response, which folks should pay attention to, and that's some one of the reasons why we've developed uh, a lot of methods which in are starting to incorporate more and more administrative data. Um, we have a uh, what we call a topic model imputation, which um, is a model-based imputation strategy that includes information from all of the other household members. Um, it's not a simple hot deck. Um, it includes relationships in your data from other areas um, as it builds, a, a, again, a coherent story, a coherent relationship for the items that need to be imputed. Additionally, with the incorporation of administrative data, there's the, there is uh, an external distribution, which is an important feature of, uh, of, the, of the way we're thinking about imputation and, in fact, weighting and response and sampling many of the different areas. We want to ensure representativeness. So that is one of the things that, uh, that we are taking very, uh, very seriously and thinking about what does the SIP need to do to think about response and, um, and, and data quality. Uh, next slide, please. Um, as I mentioned a couple slides ago, uh, we experienced some significant budgeting and uh, government shutdown related uh, impacts to SIP. Our data collection runs in a normal year from uh, with training in uh, December and January and data collection running from February to June. If you are, have been watching the federal budget cycle, we, here we are, you know, in a, a month in the middle of data collection, and we're talking about government shutdowns. So this has been the common thread for the last several years. It has particularly impacted uh, the SIP data collection. Uh, additionally, you can see these panels cover the period of time of, over the pandemic. The 2020 panel, we shifted from uh, our full in-person interviewing design to decentralized phone interviewing. All of our interviewers stayed home uh, as the pandemic ramped up and continued calling respondents where we had contact information. So one of the pieces that we attempted to do and have uh, was successful in early SIP and has been successful now is to initiate overlapping panels. And this overlapping panel design is ongoing. Um, and basically it does a couple things for us. One, it provides a fairly stable uh, resource allocation, how much we have and we can get cases um, put into the field that uh, that help the SIPs data quality um, and add more cases each year as we need to related to sample attrition and non-response. Um, and the other thing is that it is providing a, a stronger cross-sectional picture that annual, uh, that annual file with calendar month dynamics um, has more information behind it. Um, so where we are, uh, this has been a change which um, has worked out pretty well for us. Um, and I'm gonna turn it over to Neil now for the next slide. Okay, so um, thanks Jason for that introduction. Um, so Jason outlined pretty clearly the challenges that traditional data collection methods, um, you know, that we're, we're facing across the board and so, the, the Census Bureau is um, in a, you know, bureau-wide effort to, you know, face these challenges head on and find ways <clears throat> to, um, you know, create, develop, and deliver statistical products that address um, the increasingly complex and diverse needs of our users. Um, and so SIP is, so, so 
you know, we're at a point where this is a really, really unique opportunity where we can um, step in and modernize the survey of income and program participation. Um, so, so when we're thinking about the modernization efforts and moving the survey into the 21st century, right? Some of the things that we're thinking about are developing multi-mode data collection. Um, like I had said earlier, you know, developing both internet self-response and in-person options. We're thinking about redesigning the survey to be more respondent focused um, and more statistical product focused. Um, but we're also thinking about ways that we can improve the hiring, training, and staffing cycle for in-person interviews. Um, and then also thinking about ways that we can really leverage the data that's available at the Census Bureau um, and integrate into the business ecosystem to, to streamline data processing and also further incorporate the use of administrative records. So for the rest of the talk today, I am gonna dive into the new SIP design. So I'll talk about the priorities that we laid out when thinking about what we want in a new design. Um, I'll go over the design itself and I'll talk about our timeline for implementation. Then I'll go into the, the redesign elements um, for SIP. Um, and so for each of these elements, I'll talk about what our priorities or our goals are, and then what we're doing to, to make those goals a reality. So when thinking about the new SIP design, the priorities that we had in mind, there were items or components of the 2014 SIP design that we really liked and we wanted to carry forward. We felt like these items were working well for data users. Um, you know, so, so we wanted to carry these things forward, but then we also felt like there were some things that maybe we wanted to improve upon. So the priorities that we had in mind when thinking about the new SIP designer, we want to continue to develop and produce a rectangular public use file on an annual cycle. So this is, you know, releasing the same public, a similar structured public use file that we, um, that SIP users know today, where, you know, we have records for each person and each month out of the year. Um, and we are re releasing this public file on an annual cycle. Um, we also, as Jason had mentioned, we want to keep the overlapping panel structure. This allows us to maintain year to year comparisons. Um, and it also keeps resources consistent um, across years when collecting data. Um, another priority that we had in mind is we wanted to set um, field representatives or our interviewers on a schedule so that interviews are occurring every month out of the year. Um, currently, we're on a cycle where we collect data for SIP six months out of the year, and then we don't collect data for six months. Um, and so we feel that having interviews occur every month out of the year um, stabilizes the hiring and the training cycle. Um, and then finally, we wanted to develop a survey that is more respondent focused. And so what this means is we're going to move away from the event history calendar as a primary source for data collection. We also want to simplify and reduce the repetition um, in content within the survey. Um, and then we also wanted to reduce the recall burden. So with these priorities in mind, um, here is the new SIP design. And for those of you, you know, we saw presentations today um, using current, the current 2014 version of SIP. And then we also saw, you know, presentations today that used the pre-redesigned SIP. Um, and so for those of you that are, you know, familiar longtime users of SIP or have worked with the pre-redesigned SIP, this design will look very familiar to you. And so the way you can think about it is we're retrofitting the old SIP design. Um, so we have, um, so let me break this down for folks a little bit more. Um, at the top of the diagram here, um, highlighted in pink, and now I've put a red box around it, um, we have the reference year T. So you can think of this as this is the reference year that we want to process and develop the public use file for. Um, so we start by collecting information for this reference year T um, by breaking the sample up into six rotation groups. Um, Pre-redesigned SIP used four rotation groups, and so now we've broken that um, into six rotation groups with a six-month recall period. So what this means is in January and February, um, you can see in the red box, respondents will have the opportunity to respond um, via an internet self-response, um, so, so via the web. And they would answer questions from July to December of the reference year. 
And then in February, um, we would follow up with an in person interview or a CAPI interview um, for the first rotation group. We would conduct interviews um, for the rest of the rotation groups um, on a rotating basis. Um, and that would give us all of the information for our first wave of um, data. So this means that these odd numbered waves would measure updates to our roster. They measure monthly content, and then they also measure annual content. Um, and then after we've gone through all six of the rotation groups, so the full sample for the first wave, we would start at the top again and cycle through um, each of the rotation groups for the second wave. So even numbered waves are meant to be more of a follow up interview. These would measure updates to the roster and monthly content. So you could imagine that on an even numbered wave, you would receive a question like, last time you told us you worked for ABC employer, is that still the case? Are you still getting paid X number of dollars per hour? Um, so these are shorter and just capturing the monthly, monthly measures. So after we've collected information from three waves, um, the first, second, and third waves, we're able to then stitch all of this information together and develop the, the public use file that covers this entire reference year T, um, which is highlighted in the red box here. So um, one thing to note here is that the, the common reference month for interviews that are in the odd numbered waves um, is December of the reference year. So that December of the reference year is you know what we're considering using as our common reference period for all of our annual content. That's similar to what we have in the 2014 design. Um, we're you know thinking about if we want to you know shift interviews forward a month and have January the common reference month. Um, that's just something that's on our minds and we're thinking about right now, just to highlight. So when thinking about the sample design and our interview strategy. We're still going to draw the sample from household addresses um, and our preliminary contact method would be to send mailers with an option of Internet self response. So this is a web push design. Um, respondents will then have 1 month to complete their interview online in the 2nd month. We would subsample from households that did not respond and follow up with an in person interview. So our interviewers would have 1 month to complete their CAPI caseload for a given rotation group. And our subsampling would use adaptive design in order to prioritize cases. Um, we're expecting to include incentives. So we're thinking about how we can use incentives in order to get you know, more completed interviews, especially in the ISR environment. So to put things into context, um, I've overlaid the, you know, the reference period, the collection and the reference period for the current SIP design and then the collection and reference periods for the new SIP design. So highlighted in red here, you can see the, the collection time and the reference period for the current SIP design. We're currently, um, SIP collects information from January to June of, um, of the, the time after the reference period. And we, you know, the information we're collecting is very retrospective. Um, so we're collecting information from January to de December of the reference year itself. Alternatively, the new SIP design is going to collect information over the course of the reference period. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm just noting this change um, because this kind of highlights one of the challenges that we need to consider when moving from the old to the new design. So when thinking about the timeline for implementation, um, from now until July 2025, we're thinking deeply about content um, and our production development. So we're thinking about what it is within SIP um, that, that we can improve upon and what it is that you know, we want to keep or we maybe want to change. From July 2025 to July 2027, um, we will be developing the new instrument itself and moving into the new instrument software. Um, and then from July 2027 to January 2028, we'll conduct an Internet self response field test um, to see how our content fares in an ISR setting. Um, and then, as I highlighted in the pre prior slides, um, from January 2028 to June 2029, 
um, we would conduct a period of dual data collection. So we need to be able to collect this information. Like our ideal is to have one year where we can provide data users with overlapping files, right? from the old design and the new design. And this way data users have the opportunity to directly compare estimates um, in the two designs. Um, what this means though, is we need to be able to collect information over two cycles of collection. Um, so this is something that's a, on a very big wish list. Um, I can't you know, guarantee anything at this time, but that is uh, you know, given administrative costs but it is something that is on our mind and we would like to give to provide to data users. Um, finally, in January 2030, we'll be fully transitioned into the new instrument. So, as I had mentioned before, there are a lot of elements that go into a SIP redesign. Um, and so for the rest of the talk, I'm going to talk about um, each of these elements. I'll talk about the priorities that we have. Um, and then the, the things that we're doing in order to achieve these goals. So I'll talk about the changes to content, the use of administrative records, and then also our changes to survey production. So when thinking about our changes to content, our top priority is to continue to pursue SIP's mission. Um, many of you, you know, many people here today um, use SIP on a regular basis, are very familiar with SIP's mission, I think it was stated in Jason's talk at the very beginning of the day, so I don't need to repeat it, but it is something that we are very focused on continuing to pursue and fulfill. Um, some other priorities that we have in mind are we want to keep the monthly dynamics of SIP. So we want to focus on the statistical products that SIP brings to the table, the unique things um, about this survey. We also want to think about ways that we can shorten inter interviews. So finding ways that we can pare down content, consolidate content, and also use administrative records where it's relevant or possible. So the things that we're doing in order to make changes to content right now are our subject matter experts are actively engaged in making improvements to their content. Um, branches are meeting across the Bureau to coordinate on improvements to, to topics within the survey. We're also, um, you know, some of you may know, but the Census Bureau is currently fully remote. Um, so we are holding on-site meetings or in-person meetings throughout the month of March um, to really focus in and take a more detailed look into the changes that we're making in SIP. Um, we're also working with survey methodologists to test our content. So we're conducting cognitive tests. Um, one of our cognitive tests right now is to think about how we can develop a standardized set of questions that could work across content areas within the SIP. Um, we're also placing questions on high frequency surveys, and this allows us to test and develop content in an ISR setting and to see how these questions fare in Internet self-response before the final launch. Finally, we're holding focus groups to receive feedback from field representatives um, on topic areas. Our field representatives interact with the instrument and they're the ones that are talking with respondents face to face. And so getting an understanding of how our respondents interact with the instrument, um, you know, and learning from field representatives firsthand allows us to um, figure out ways that we can improve upon our content. So I want to give an example of the changes that we're considering. This is a very stylized example, um, very simplified. And so one thing I want to note is between each of these topic areas, right, between EHC programs and post topic, uh, post EHC topics, there are additional topics within the survey. Um, so note that this is not, you know, an exhaustive list of all of the items in the survey, um, but it's, it's an example of things that we're considering. So we're thinking about ways that we can co-locate and consolidate content. So in the current instrument, in the event history calendar, we have programs that are placed like SSI, food stamps and SNAP, and WIC. And then we go through and ask a number of EHC, additional EHC topics. And then we talk, um, we ask questions about post EHC programs. So like disability income and food assistance. And then later in the instrument, after a number of other topics, we ask questions about disability and then again, later in the instrument, we ask questions about food security. 
one of the things that we hear from respondents and from field representatives is, um, you know, while these questions are very, you know, different from each other, we still hear respondents ask the question, well, you've already asked me this, why are you asking me again? Or this feels redundant. So in order to try to reduce that feeling of redundancy, we're finding ways that we can place topics that are similar conceptually together in order to make the instrument feel just more coherent. So you can see for program receipt, we would move the food security questions up before asking about food stamps or SNAP and WIC and food assistance. That way, all of the food related items are together. And then later in the instrument, we would ask questions about disability status and follow up with questions related to disability income and SSI. Um, I say that, you know, these are things we're considering because there are considerations within this, right? We want to think about how we want to order these topics. If we want to have the programs asked first and then the food security, or if we want to ask food security first and then follow up with the programs. So that's, you know, something that we're thinking about at this time. Moving on to the use of administrative records. Our priorities are we really want to leverage the enterprise data in just in order to use third party records. And we want to use these in order to improve our data quality, reduce respondent burden, and really embrace the statistical products first focus um, within the Bureau um, in order to find you know, the best combined sources for characteristics. So when thinking about you know, what we're doing in order to improve these things, to improve data quality, um, we want to expand the use of statistical model-based imputation. So SIP right now already uses model-based imputation for 40 topics um, over and over 100 items. Um, and we want to think about how we can use administrative records to expand upon that model-based imputation. We also want to use administrative records in the development of survey weights. There's some research within the Bureau right now looking at how um, estimates change when administrative records are incorporated into survey weights. Um, so that's something that we are exploring. We also want to supplement the frames data with administrative data. And finally, we want to use adaptive design to improve the efficiency and the representativeness for our sample in order to optimize collection. When thinking about reducing respondent burden, um, one specific thing that we're exploring is using the business register to develop an employer address lookup tool. Right now, the collection of employer addresses within the SIP is a pretty onerous task for respondents, and they have a tendency to misreport. So we're thinking it would be much easier if a respondent could say, I, live, I work at XYZ restaurant on Main Street, and that would pop up, um, that would cause a number of options to pop up. And the respondent could then choose the restaurant that they work at, um, and the address would then populate for them. Um, if they are able to choose the their employer and the address that they work at, that would create a connection between the SIP and the business register, and that would allow us to, you know, explore um, taking questions related to that establishment off path. Um, and, and model that, that removed content. Um, so these would be questions related to the number of establishments, um, the number of people working at the establishment, um, things like that. And then we're also thinking about ways to develop alternative estimates and continue this, the use of SIP synthetic beta, um, synthetic data. So, you know, we're thinking about how we can get small area estimate for wealth and other topics. Um, we're also thinking about you know, where we can house SIP synthetic beta. Um, I'm so excited that, that there was a SIP synthetic beta paper today. Um, I really love the enthusiasm for SSB. Um, and so, you know, we're really hoping to um, find a home for that. So when thinking about the changes to survey production, the priorities that we have in mind are we're moving from SAS to Python. Um, we're also, we would like to use administrative records in our editing and processing. And then finally, we want to enter, leverage the enterprise data lake um, to really expand upon computing options. So the things that we're doing in order to, to make these changes happen are our SIP programmers have started converting SIP edits from SAS to Python. Um, our programmers have also completed a pilot study on the use of hot deck imputation in Python. 
thinking about how processing times change um, when we move from SAS to Python for hot deck imputation. And as an alternative to this, our subject matter experts are conducting research projects, um, a research project to explore the use of model based imputation as a replacement to hot deck imputation. And then finally, we're thinking about how we can improve the editing process, right? What are the standard operating procedures for edits that better fit within a Python framework? Um, and how can we build in parallel computing in order to optimize our data processing? So there's been a lot of fruitful discussion today. Um, and thank you so much for your time. Um, I'm very excited to continue the fruitful discussion. I'm going to stop sharing my screen at this time and open the floor up to questions. So thanks everyone. We don't have any questions yet. And I'm sure people are sitting there really thinking about what are what are they doing? And it seems like it seems like we might folks are worried that they might lose content. Um, so Jason, um, sorry, Jose has his hand raised. Oh, yeah, excellent. Jose. Yeah. Yes. Two things uh, I wanted to ask. One is more high level and one is more uh, detailed. On the high level, could I, should I think of the redesign as kind of combining the best of both worlds of what the SIF has gone through over the past like 30 or so years? Because it seems like you're trying to cut, uh, reduce the recall time, yet provide, make the data a lot more accessible. Because I agree. Um, it was fun as a graduate student to merge the different waves and topical modules in the 1996 and so panel, but may I'm just getting a little too crusty, but I really like the uh, rectangular form uh, of the modern of the newer panels. The question is the recall bias, which it seems like you're addressing head on. Is that an accurate, I guess, short? Yeah, version? I think I think that's that's absolutely right on. Um, Addressing the uh, the the length of the recall period was one of the recommendations in uh, the second to last uh, CN stat panel. Um, thinking about a six month recall period, they were thinking about the four month recall period. Um, we are we 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 are splitting the difference. We're going with the six months um, rather than going all the way back to four. Um, and we think that. Um, I agree completely. One of our priorities was making sure that the data stay as usable as possible for data users um, and to keep the cost of entry low. Um, the, the, the catch is for us that we now have, instead of one file to work with to get that calendar year uh, estimate, we're going to work with 18 files. So three waves by six rotations each. Um, and so that does take a lot of thought on our part um, in terms of the data processing, the data structure, how we're going to bring things together. Um, and, but you're absolutely right. That's our goal is shorten the recall period, have interviewers working every single month. Um, so that reduces the hiring cycle, the training cycle, um, and work towards having, uh, um, having, um, sorry, there was a word there and it just went, um, a stable content that we, we can, we can put together, um, that calendar year period, um, and really emphasize that the mission of SIP is staying the same. And we are trying very hard to streamline content so that the youth data respondent experience, the respondent experience is is more streamlined than it was before. Um, and I see a, a comment in the chat that Nancy is asking, um, will calendar year puffs still be available in SAS format? So right now um, we are working with uh, with the Python programming to uh, to figure out this, the um, 
the formatting. Uh, the default format out of Python at the moment is CSV, but we, as we currently provide data sets in multiple formats, we're still looking um, and would expect to continue to provide data in multiple formats. Um, there was another question. Claire is asking, can folks speak to when data users should expect to have opportunities to weigh in on the redesign and what data user engagement might look like? Yeah, so this was a very important first step to us to have this discussion get started now. Um, as you can see, we're working on a timeline that um, we're hoping to have content ironed out between now and mid-2025. So we will be uh, trying to have additional, um, additional discussions like this as soon as we go through our initial review and uh, do content layout. Um, we want to share that broadly with the SIP data user community and see what, uh, what feedback we get. We know that there are probably going to be some content elements which we have to make a, a decision not to include. But we're hoping that we are being, you know, really thoughtful about what stays in in the survey and how it can continue to to do what it needs to do, like for all the analyses and models that everyone saw uh, running here today to support programs at other agencies. And I know I saw that. Yeah, and I think that that's, you know, that's an important thing just to keep in mind is that we understand that our first, um, we conduct SIP kind of, it's a Census Bureau survey, but we conduct it um, on behalf of the broader federal government um, and on behalf of, you know, other users outside of the federal government. Um, it is a data source. It's an it, it, it's not the CPS. It doesn't um, exist for one number. It exists for a broad set of uses. Um, it's not a mandatory survey. It's, you know, it is a voluntary household survey and it's a hard one. Um, so we, we, we understand that we're providing the survey for a lot of different purposes um, and trying to make sure that, um, that it, it meets the needs and meets the requests for the programmatic uses um, that it that it has been able to support and hopefully supports them better in a lot of ways. That's that is the underlying reason for some of my questions during the day, which is, you know, what do you need? What's what are you missing? Um, what would work here? And to the to the question about um, the lifetime earnings, you know, if we put a modeled lifetime earnings item or modeled years worked based on you know other data would that would that be something of value it, which also might not add any respondent burden whatsoever um and so just we have um a few other questions in the chat but then we also have a raised hand so becky yep. your hand is raised I want to say, like, as somebody who worked on the previous redesign, I am so impressed with with this ambitious thing that you guys are, are taking on. Um, so I just had like one kind of little detail question. Um, if you're going to be releasing sort of this rectangular file, but you have those overlapping, you know, like rotation groups, you're going to have sort of extra data at the beginning from the people who are in earlier rotation groups and extra data at the end for people who are in the later ones. And I was just wondering kind of what is going to happen to that data? And also, um, you know, maybe very technical nitty gritty question, but in terms of like editing, how are, is it like, how is the, the editing going to work? Is it only gonna be the 12 months of data or are you gonna do something more cohesive where you go across multiple waves or, or how's that gonna work? Yeah, so there's a, there's a bunch of pieces that are a little bit a uh, little bit TBA um, or TBD. Uh, and so um, in terms of what are we doing with the time before, one of the things that we're considering is putting out 
a year T minus one annual uh, set of information. So kind of bounding annual information that's drawn from the, you know, the left side of the timeline. Um, if we switch to move everything a month over and have a January common month, then we would probably pull in the January from the end, you know, and, and be able to show, have that month as well. Um, in terms of what are we going to do with the, 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 the data in that kind of triangle that's before the reference period? Well, in wave one, that's really the only place where there's a question about it. Um, after wave one, it has a, it has a use and a place throughout the rest of um, the data structure. Um, but in wave one, what it will do is it will be information that is um, passed into the wave two interview. So it will help uh, establish all of the information that we need to then follow up on in wave two. Um, and internally, uh, I would expect that we would probably be able to work with different components of the waves maybe taking one rotation group at a time and looking at, at things, but that's all, that's all down the road. Um, for the most part, we are really focused on making sure that the product that we deliver to data users is as you know, coherent and easy to use as possible, given the complexity of how it will be collected. Um, I think there's a, a question, Dependent data collected in, this is Roxanne's question, uh, dependent data collected in ISR will flow to future survey periods in CAPI. So that's our belief. Um, so all there, the piece to this is that um, we are in the midst of this while kind of at, because of a shift in the business ecosystem at Census, um, where we are having, there, there is new software in development for managing cases and collecting data and bringing data back and then storing it. Um, it is supposed to transition across data across modes. We will be using a common uh, instrument for both ISR and CAPI. So, um, so that is our plan is that with, even within the data period, the data collection period, um, data collected in one mode will be available in another. Um, we have a couple years still to, you know, work that out and prove it in. Um, target length in terms of time or questions. Thank you, Matthew. Um, so the target length right now, a SIP interview is approximately an hour per adult. Um, so think about your average household size. 2.1 adults or so. Um, we're we're talking about an interview that takes over two hours um, on average. And what we're thinking about in terms of ISR is who the reporting person is going to be. Uh, most likely, we're going to have a direct reports by one respondent for the most part. They're going to report about the other people as necessary or about a household level information as necessary. So we're, we're going through a process as we look at content of thinking very carefully about who's answering the question, what are we asking them to tell us, and what is the best way to both ask it and record it. Um, the time that we're hoping to get to is somewhere under an hour for the whole interview. Um, so, I think that we're in a place where we're going to be close to being able to do that, but it's going to mean really, again, thinking carefully about the flow of the questions. Um, and we always keep coming up with good justifications for all the content that we have. So cutting content is really, really hard. Um, okay, and Jose is asking, by linking to the business register, um, could you provide extra information on employers? Um, so we have to be careful about what we provide from uh, an administrative source like the business register. It exists as a frame for the economic directorate's work. Um, and that said, the part of the thinking about statistical products first is the integration of resources across sources, across areas of the Census Bureau. So 
my answer to that question would be yes. The, the, the type of additional information out of the business register would probably be modeled or as Neil had in the presentation, synthetic. It, it would be some, uh, some estimate from derived from business register but it wouldn't be the business register value just dropped onto a onto a record. We, we would protect it um, in, in probably at least a couple ways. Did we miss any, Neil? So it looks like we don't have any questions in the Q and A, and no hands are raised. Um, do folks have any other questions? So I think I would just like to, at the end. Um, here do a couple things. One, assure everyone on the call that there will be continued uh, discussion and continued information about uh, the redesign as we go forward. Um, certainly by the time we get to uh, an annual conference next year, um, there will be a lot more information, but between now and then, um, I would hope that we will have had several opportunities to have discussions with external folks um, in different venues. Uh, you can certainly, we will be at, um, at a number of the academic conferences over the next six months, um, not necessarily as a SIP workshop, but um, we do plan to be able to be there to talk to folks. Um, and, uh, and we will have organized, maybe virtual, but organized uh, SIP information sessions over the course of the next year. And, as we go through this redesign process. Um, I want to thank all of the presenters all day long um, who presented, all of the uh, our moderators who came on and, uh, and helped organize everything and keep everything moving, and all the good questions that folks have asked. Um, we really appreciate the interaction with the SIP community. And, um, and, and want to make sure that that, that keeps going. Um, so you have my heartfelt thanks. I, and Dave, I, I think, nope, Dave had to leave. That's right. So, and I will share Dave's, uh, Dave Waddington's thanks. Um, he uh, and I have spent a lot of time thinking about how to bring SIP um, into the light a little bit more and make, making sure that uh, we reach our data user community. Um, and this is this has been a good step. So I want to thank thank you all very much.